military-grade capacitors and other tough components enhance durability and performance. Dual ball fan bearings can last up to twice as long as sleeve bearing designs. The extra flatness allows for better contact with the die for improved thermal transfer. Capacitors that meet military grade certification make the tough stand tall amongst the competition. So we're not really clear on what military grade means. Going back to that era of computers, uh, this is perhaps along the same lines as aircraft grade aluminum also known as aluminum. But either way, we're reviewing the ASUS RTX 3080 Tough today, and despite some of its, well, overambitious marketing, the product is actually not that bad performance-wise. Just, just a weird set of marketing choices for the Newegg page and the product page. But we're gonna be reviewing the Tough today, and we're looking at the, uh, the flatness, actually. Coincidentally, that was brought up the mounting pressure, the thermals, the acoustics, and overclocking performance, among other things. Before that, this video is brought to you by EK and the EK AIO series. We recently reviewed the EK AIO DRGB360 as one of the top performers in our CPU cooler charts, advantage from its fan performance and high quality pump internals that we found during our teardown. If you're looking for a high performance RGB CPU cooler with longer steady state times, check out the EK AIO 360 and 240 at the links in the description below. So the ASUS Tough is, well, it doesn't come like this, but it's supposed to be a $700 card. It's along the, the same pricing tier as the Gigabyte Eagle. And uh, Eagle's supposed to be $700, the FE is supposed to be $700. Finding it's a different story, but we're reviewing the cards as they're listed and then this content will obviously be useful to you if you're making a decision when one does come in stock uh, so that you're prepared for when stock pops up, knowing what you want to buy or what you might want to avoid. We've already reviewed the Gigabyte RTX 3080 Eagle. It's their uh, low end SKU, as far as low end can be for 3080s anyway. The FE card has been thoroughly reviewed at this point and we're working on some others like the FTW3 and maybe the XC3 Ultra at some point. But for now, we've got three main cards to look at. We'll be focusing on the quality of life features, as we call them. So that's going to be acoustics, noise normalized thermals, which looks at the efficiency of a cooler design and ignores the fact that a, any cooler could brute force the fans and achieve good thermals as a result of that. So noise normalized thermals, looking at the auto fan ramping speed. If you do your, use your GPU in auto, which most people do, we're testing that as well. Uh, that's mostly the fan curve following a vBIOS temperature target at that point, so we'll be determining that as well. Power consumption is in here, overclocking is in here, and gaming we're actually going to skip because it doesn't matter. The difference from one partner model to the next is a couple FPS at absolute best, and when, when we say a couple here, it's in the literal sense of one to two FPS. Average FPS is most commonly what you're going to see, so uh, it's just not worth going through all of those charts to show what we can already predict. And uh, ultimately, you're picking cards based on price, warranty support, accessibility, whether you can actually buy it, in other words, accessibility in your region, and then the noise profile, power consumption, cooling abilities, stuff like that. So that's the focus today. Uh, we're also going to be doing a disassembly of the card, hence why it is in this state. Uh, all the testing was done before disassembly. Obviously, we had to add thermocouples for some of it, so the backlit was removed for that. And you'll get to see some of our uh, gripes with the assembly. But overall, the Tough has surprised us, considering the Tough's uh, very poor history in GPUs in the not-too-distant past. So this has been an uplift for Asus. It looks like they're actually trying to come back and fix this line of GPUs. Our first test will use noise normalized thermals, which helps to adjust for fan speed and test efficiency of the coolers by controlling most of the variables. In this instance, normalizing for a given noise of 40 dBA at a 20 inch distance and with a noise floor of 26 dB allows us to eliminate advantages gained by just blasting the fan speeds unreasonably loud. This levels the playing field, but it doesn't control for power, so we have to keep an eye on that. We're still testing cards, so this chart is thus far sparsely populated. For GPU thermals, the RTX 3080 FE ran warmest when normalized to 40 dBA, testing at 70 degrees Celsius. This was while running a lower total board power as well, so that means it's considerably worse than the other two, the two partner models, because it's running lower power and it's also running hotter. 
That's doubly true when considering the price equivalence of the Eagle, which is supposed to sell for about $700. The tough is the best so far when noise normalized at 56 degrees Celsius for the core versus 60.8 on the Eagle and about 70 for the FE card. VRM MOSFET thermals measured on the PCB put us at 61 degrees on the ASUS card measured in the center of the left side VRM near the IO and the Eagle in the same spot measured at 55 degrees Celsius. For GDDR6X thermals, the ASUS card tested at 54 degrees on the flip chip side of the board and the Gigabyte card tested at 73 degrees and 65.8 degrees, depending on which number you're looking at. We had trouble getting this test to work successfully on the FE card, so it's not present in this chart. We'll next look at auto thermals. These show the out-of-the-box thermals, so the fan can do whatever it wants. Showing RPM is pointless since the fans are different counts and sizes, so we'll just put the noise level next to each entry. This mostly shows the VBIOS target for temperature, with the fans following that target. The FE card runs at about 66 degrees Celsius in this workload, but maintains the loudest noise level at about 40, 41.1 dBA in this test. The RTX 3080 Eagle ran at 37 dBA here, noticeably quieter and at a slight reduction in core temperature, but while also running 20 watts higher for power target. The Tough plotted 64.7 degrees Celsius when set to quiet mode, which had it at 33.5 dBA. This is highly efficient compared to both of the other coolers, but it does run 5 degrees warmer than its own performance VBIOS, where noise levels escalate to 37.7 dBA in this particular power virus workload. VRM MOSFET thermals for the measured section of the VRM plotted 74 degrees on the Eagle when left to auto control, 61 degrees on the Tough with performance mode, and 67 degrees on the Tough with quiet mode. Memory thermals were in the range of 54 to 61 degrees on the Tough, and all of these results are well within the thermal spec for each of the components for the Gigabyte and the Tough cards, so either of those two would be fine. Purely from a cooler standpoint, ignoring extra features like dual VBIOS, there's really no significant downside to either of these two coolers, and both outperform the FE card. This next chart shows the auto controlled noise as plotted against a real workload. This is with all other system cooling using passive methods, so only the GPU fans are making noise. The noise floor is about 26 to 27 dB. The Asus Tough Card's auto configuration has its fan ramping quickly, comparable to the other cards, and with relatively low hysteresis. The curve settles after just 100 seconds and plots at about 38 dBA. The FE card peaks at 41 dBA during its heaviest fan spike, and then settles to about 39 to 40 dBA. The Eagle card ran just under the Asus card when both were auto-configured, plotting at 37.7 dBA. We'll next look at mounting pressure and the evenness of pressure across the surface of the 3080 Tough card. This test uses a chemical paper to detect pressure and a NIST traceable scanner to produce a pseudo-color image alongside a 3D bump map of the pressure. Just looking at the pressure map alone, there's a lack of pressure on the right side towards the uh, PCIe power connectors on the card, and particularly in the top right corner of the GPU. This doesn't mean that there's no contact at all, just that the pressure is too low here. The gap would obviously be filled with paste, but ultimately this is a weak point on ASUS's cooler, and the overall performance could be better with more even pressure distribution across the silicon. If we overlay the pressure map on the ASUS GPU die, you'll see how poor the coverage is once out of the center and out of the lower left parts of the image. For comparison, we'll put some pressure maps up from our review of the RTX 3080 Eagle and the Founders Edition cards, just so that you can see what it looks like on two other devices. Pressure doesn't indicate flatness or height of the surface, but it can point towards a potential issue with how level or how flat the surface is. This test shows surface flatness of the cold plate as measured with a special instrument. We test from a known and calibrated zero point and check for depth in microns. The ASUS Tough Cooler plotted its core tiles in the range of 11 microns to 16 microns with the maximum measurement at 40 microns and the minimum at about three. A tighter cluster here is better, so the Eagle cold plate is the best that we've tested thus far with this new approach. Wider measurements, like the one seen on the RTX 3080 FE, are less desirable. One-off spikes aren't too bad as long as they're just one-offs, like in the Eagles plot, but running into enough of those spikes to widen the box indicates a problem. The Tough is overall good for flatness of the cold plate, but is challenged for pressure. So with these two data points, what we know is that the issue isn't one of height or how 
even the cold plate is, but one of where the screws are positioned and how they're tensioned. Time to look at frequency behavior of the cart. Tested in a looping 3D Mark workload with a repeat frame render, the Tuff with its Performance V BIOS averaged about 2001 MHz throughout this test, with spiking a result of the power limits. The Quiet V BIOS ran at 1978 MHz, primarily a result of the increased temperature from the reduced fan speeds, so the trade-off is worth maybe a couple FPS in most titles, maximally. But the noise reduction is likely more noticeable than that. The next chart is intentionally zoomed to a range of a couple hundred megahertz. This is to make things more legible. Comparatively, the Gigabyte Eagle averages about 2,000 megahertz in the same workload, tying with the ASUS Tough in its performance v BIOS. The Founders Edition card plots about 1929 megahertz, but has a further fall due to its higher operating temperature. Here's some quick charts to show power consumption across a few benchmarks. The RTX 3080 Tough with its performance VBIOS plotted 338 watts or 350 watts when manually overclocked. Its quiet VBIOS plotted within error of the stock performance number. The Eagle pulls 334 watts overclocked and stock as well because it doesn't offer any power increases via the slider and thus is the worse overclocker versus the Tough overall. Additional power means more headroom for overclocking, but it becomes significantly less efficient as you try to ramp up the performance with each step on NVIDIA's Ampere architecture. Power consumption in a gaming workload shows similar behavior. The RTX 3080 Tough plots around 338 to 339 watts without a manual OC, or about 351 with an OC. The 3080 FE BIOS still has a higher power target, pushing to 367 watts. This table is our own quick reference table for internal notes when we're overclocking a card. This is tested with a different benchmark scene than the earlier frequency tests, and so it's not directly comparable. The ASUS Tough ran at about 1935 MHz when fully self-regulated in our looping Time Spy Extreme GT1 benchmark. A power increase alone, with nothing else, boosted that to about 1950 MHz, with core offsets proving mostly unstable, represented by the F for fail demarcation in the far right column. Our final stable setting was a 60 MHz offset and 1000 MHz GDDR6X offset. As a reminder, an offset for the core is versus a baseline, so that'll fluctuate based on the load in terms of the final numbers that you get. You shouldn't just copy the numbers if you end up buying one of these. Make sure you do the testing and the stepping on your own. 1000 for memory proved barely stable, and we'd probably have to drop it down to 880 to 920 megahertz offset for higher confidence and 24 seven stability. It's memory overclocks well, but that's not because of the card or because of ASUS, that's just chance. The core didn't overclock very well at all on this one, although some tests had it spiking to 2025 megahertz, the end average was closer to 1980 megahertz with the offsets applied. Again, that's not directly comparable to the previous test, but it's not particularly exciting either, even versus this test, for the other cards. We're too limited on Ampere ultimately to get much more out of it without significant power boosts to the power limits that are in VBIOS. Finally, for games, as stated earlier, we're not going to bother with showing game numbers for the partner models going forward because they're all going to be within 1 to 2 FPS of each other for the most part, so it's irrelevant. You should be buying based on the quality of life features like efficiency acoustically, the thermal performance, maybe multiple view BIOS, overclocking options, or other things like simply price. Gaming at this point doesn't really matter once you've decided if you want a 3080 or a 3090 or whatever it may be, because the performance is all going to be so close together that the only real differences will be in those earlier named features. Okay, so now we're going to take apart the ASUS Tough. Normally, we often do these in standalone videos, but for some of these reviews, we're just coupling them in if it's not too complicated a board. So first of all, this one has a uh, comment on it again, but the tire tread marks on the back, which is weird, kind of a, I don't know. They're trying to say that it's tough, so tough you can run over it, I guess, but uh, not really very odd choice of branding. But either way, the disassembly is pretty easy. So this back plate, you can look at it and already tell how it's assembled to the board because you can see these threads uh, are facing the opposite way. So there's screws going through the PCB into the back plate. Unfortunately, the downside of that approach to design is that you can't just remove the back plate. You have to take apart the whole thing to get the back plate off. So that's a downside. Upside is a bit more support for a, um, you'll see that there's an extra heat sink structure in there. Potentially more support for the card against sag, but uh, it, is, it is more obnoxious to disassemble as a result. 
So we'll track these screws on the GN mod mat. You can grab one of the mod mats on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like. They're work surfaces for this type of stuff. And uh, we also sell the tool kits like the one I'm using on the store. And they have all the tools you'll need to take apart. In the very least, this partner card, but many others as well. So these are actually technically, I could have done these screws with a Phillips one screwdriver, which is more standard. But these for the, uh, the spring tension screws for the retention plate are actually a Phillips zero, which is kind of abnormal. So a little bit smaller. There's a tamper seal there. I already took it apart for thermocouple placement. So you can see that mark. But I don't think it technically says warranty void if removed. It's just a red circle. So these, Asus likes to do this. These are spring tensioned, which is actually a good thing. Although very uncommon, to, these screws are typically used for the GPU itself back before NVIDIA switched to the leaf spring that AMD uses. The IO plate does not need to come off for this. So that's disconnected. Okay, so here's the inside of the card. The, there are two cables connected. One's going to be, I think, for LEDs and one will be for fans. Might as well check what the fans are. I actually haven't looked at that yet. Board's fairly simple. The cooler also fairly standard, but this plate here did really well for Sapphire with its nitro design. Can't remember if the Pulse used it, but for the 5700 XD nitro for sure, they had a separate plate like this. Typically works pretty well. So it's just additional fins mounted directly to the memory and part of the VRM over here. You can see there's actually a heat pipe running through this stack. So the benefit of this is that rather than technically syncing the GPU and the memory and part of the VRM all into the same copper cold plate where potentially you might drive the GPU thermals up a little bit. It depends on how, you know, how the greater design works. But you could drive GPU thermals up slightly because you're sharing a solution to cool the same thing. This is normally more of a concern with closed loop liquid coolers like a 120 mil CLC where you have a certain amount of water and heat capacity. But either way, having a separate set of heat sinks that can be accessed through the fin stack, the like parent fin stack uh, via fans, normally works pretty well. And that's what we saw in our testing. For the heat pipes, you want as many of these to cross the silicon as possible. So it looks like ASUS has one, two, three, four that make pretty much full contact with the silicon. And then there's partial contact, but these mostly just hit the rest of the plate on the outsides. These are going to be six mil heat pipes, and they are copper heat pipes that are nickel plated. If it weren't already obvious, you can see a bit of copper right there to prove it. This is a copper cold plate that is nickel plated. And then over here, you can see where the thermal pad is for the inductors. So that's down over on this side on the board. There's your inductor line. Uh, this isn't super common. The companies have started doing this more. Inductors run really hot, but Inside of an inductor housing, it's literally just a coil of copper. So they can run pretty high. It's not, not uncommon for them to have a spec of around 150C. But cooling, it's certainly not bad. It gets the heat away from the PCB, which would otherwise be the primary path for that heat to go, uh, aside from sort of drafting off the top of it. In terms of shunt resistors, we've pointed these out on the other boards as well. So might as well point, point them out here. It's not like it used to be. There's more than two now. So you have five up here that will be for these two PCIe headers. If you want to do a shunt mod, generally we'd recommend these days, now that we've tried it, doing a soldered approach, but you are physically modding the card. You have to be careful. You could damage something. Uh, liquid metal is a little bit risky as well. Either way, you don't gain too much for power, but uh, it tricks the power target into thinking it's consuming less than it is. Let's remove the back plate. So to get that off, we have to take these screws out. They're going through the board and into the back plate, and then we'll look at the rest of the cooler and the fans. So this is kind of interesting too, I just noticed this. This thermal pad is on top of the heatsink to the memory. So it's actually memory, thermal pad, heatsink, thermal pad, heatsink, which is very inefficient. Uh, this might be a scenario where actually sharing the cold plate solution and syncing straight to the memory rather than going through an additional interface or two might have been a better approach, but uh, we don't have an AB way to test that. To be fair also at this point, ASUS's design does well enough where it's 
They don't need the extra performance. We like to see maximize performance out of a design, obviously. But uh, they, they may have determined this was an easier path to go. Typically, companies don't actually do a whole bunch of prototyping for these prior to a launch because of the tight timelines. So it's unlikely that they've tried all the things we're talking about. Probably just went with some uh, standard design concepts. That should free the backplate unless I missed one. All right, so the thermal pad's on there too. So backplate, backup card. You can see that there's uh, contact to the plate, the actual metal of the plate, not the plastic. For the memory, it's a little bit of extra surface area. It's not finned or anything, so you don't get a ton. But uh, we always want to see the backplate actually get used for something other than allegedly structural support and sinking some of the back components, or even just the PCB into the plate uh, can certainly help a little bit. These are extremely thin pads. These look like a half mil pads, and those are for the capacitors back here. So those caps and those caps are contacting the very thin, and you're gonna go with half mil thermal pads. Might even be less than that, but. Uh, and then this is about a one mil thermal pad. That's for the memory. These are for the memory. Pretty simple stuff. No wiring on the back, no LEDs on the back. There's a VBIO switch and that's it. Okay, so let's remove this piece. I actually have not taken this off yet. So we'll get to see if it's thermal putty or pads. It is, in fact, it looks like one uniform piece. Yep, so thermal pads for that. These are the kind that get destroyed, obviously. We've got more of these if we need to replace them, but uh, so I wouldn't really, you shouldn't need to take this off for anything unless you're doing a full, like unless you're going with a water block or something, because uh, if you want to repaste, you can do that without taking this off, which we do recommend, especially because the pads are the type that are more likely to get destroyed. Uh, if you don't have backups laying around, then you may want to leave that on. It's a very light piece of metal, but looks like it's uh, just aluminum fins, pretty simple. Already explained how it works, but the one heat pipe in there will help move the heat around, especially away from the MOSFETs over here, which is what that's contacting. So you see that's, that seats down like this. That gives us contact to the MOSFETs for this half of the VRM, and then the rest of it's mostly cooling the memory. Okay, let's take the Let's take a fan off just to get a model number on that. A couple of you have asked us to do this more often with teardowns because uh, I was not aware of this, but apparently the small form factor PC community really likes replacing fans for GPUs. So not something I've paid too much attention to, but I guess you get potentially quieter ones if you do that. These are technically Phillips one head screws, but I can't fit the driver in there. Uh, so we're going to go with the Phillips Zero and just be careful. One more, so there's three total. Looks like there is something else holding it in. It might be under the shroud, which is very unfortunate if that's true. Okay, that's annoying. So this is, Asus should do a better job with this. So this isn't just like a small form factor enthusiast <laughs> niche request. Fan replacement is the only thing that a user should uh, really be asking for in terms of what a, a ask you, in terms of what they're going to ask a company to make very easy for them. The most common single point of failure on almost any computer component, but especially GPUs, is fan death from either getting jammed with dust over the years, running too hot because it's jammed with dust, or just chance. Uh, fan death is the most common. It should be as simple as one screw and then a socketable fan. If they're not going to do a pin to pad thing, maybe they're worried about contact over time or vibrational issues, doing three screws and wires is OK. But they should not be connected to a piece of plastic that is connected to the shroud like this to where we can't actually remove the fan. So now if you're a user, you don't have to actually take this off the board typically, and I hope this remains true, to get the fans replaced. You should be able to just access it externally without even needing to worry about opening a card. In this instant, instance, it looks like you'll at least have to open the shroud. So there are three screws here. 
think you can still do all this without opening the card. But it is, uh, it's extra steps that you start adding steps like this for a lot of users, you start scaring them off, and then it becomes weeks of RMA hell for everybody involved. It's a waste of money for ASUS because now their RMA and their support departments uh, are dealing with requests that were 100% preventable if they could just ship a user a fan and let them replace it. So ASUS, if you're listening, I've just saved you money uh, if you actually improve the design. All right, there's a shroud, aluminum, which is not really good in use, but whatever. Uh, LED cable right there. That's routed in a really annoying way, so we're not going to take that out. Here's the culprit of our issue. There was a screw inaccessible under the shroud, which there's no reason that screw needs to be inaccessible or present. Okay, same type of screw. There's the fan. So if you want to buy one or replace it if it dies, 12 volt as always, 0 0.45 amps is the spec. And in terms of the exact model, I try and read it. Champion is the brand <laughs> with a suspiciously similar letter C to the, the other Champion brand. And the model is CF9010. 0U12D, if you ever want to replace one. This one, not that it matters, made in July of 2020. This is annoying too, by the way. So if you want to replace the fans, it looks like you're going to have to contend with this mess. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's got a, got a weird connector on it. And you'll just have to remove this adhesive wrap and you'll be able to replace it. So that'll be it for the teardown. Fairly simple in terms of the actual cooling solution. PCB also fairly simple relative to the other 30 series PCBs we've seen so far. Fans could use improvement the way they're mounted, but overall the cooler did pretty well in thermal testing. So with the limited data set we have now, it is technically in the lead in at least a few of those charts. It could probably be a little bit better, but uh, hard to fault them too much when they are already leading. Gigabyte is very competitive, though, with its Eagle card. So that's it. We have a lot more of these 3080s to test, obviously, but we kind of slowed down on it when the inventory was obviously not uh, overflowing. So we have a Gaming X Trio from MSI coming up probably next. We have an FTW3 we want to look at. Uh, we've got a 3090 FTW3 review coming up as well. But for now, the Asus Tough is technically superior in some of these charts. The Gigabyte Eagle is close enough that between the two of them, sans a couple of things like overclocking support, we're fine with either one. If, if you see one in stock and not the other, and you want to just pull the trigger on something that's presumably $700, either one would be a better choice on average than a Founders Edition card. Founders Edition card can do a higher power uh, target for overclocking, which is potentially beneficial. But the tough is somewhat likely to get custom V BIOSes in the future. And uh, that is, a, a potential positive. If you dig around through forums, you might find a, a more unlocked V BIOS. The Eagle is very unlikely to get that kind of treatment. Uh, Eagle is not something we would recommend for anyone who's extremely interested in overclocking or competitive overclocking, but it's fine for a stock out of box user experience. This card's got a couple of other perks as well. So it is easier to measure to take, uh, it's got checkpoints flagged on it as Roman pointed out and one of his content pieces about the shunt mods. And it's also got an EVC2 connector for Elmore's voltage controller also, as Roman pointed out. So some upsides there if you're into overclocking, uh, but because of the power limits, you will have to either hunt down an unlocked V BIOS if you really want to do some competitive work, or you'll have to do some hard mods to it, like shunt resistor mods, uh, among other options. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. You can subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us directly by funding this type of testing with product purchases. You can get mod mats, toolkits, and more. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.